You guys are kidding. I broke the bed. You're right. Way over my head. Welcome back, everyone. Next exciting episode. Next exciting episode of OVRU. Right now, we're online. Um, we're mic'd up, so we're being convenient as well. So, so, the purpose of this session is actually just to do a quick summary of you know, what we've achieved over the last year in relation to our KPIs. Uh, and also, just to have a look at our technology stack. Uh, you know, you know that underpins everything that happens with OERU, and that's kind of the purpose of the session is so that we can then move into our traditional critical frame review, where we actually break out into into four groups and we have a look at our progress this year, our strengths, weaknesses, you know, our opportunities for improvement, uh, which then feeds into the meeting and uh, helps determine the priorities for the meeting. If that makes sense in terms of sequence. So I'll do a quick uh, overview and rundown of uh, what we've achieved this year. Uh, we have a full. Uh, within the wiki, which, which is quite interesting, as we have, if I go to the planning page of the wiki, uh, we have a master list. Um, of all the 2016 KPIs, right? Um, and this came out of the planning from the last meeting, uh, and we can, you know, sort by you know what has been achieved. Now, obviously, with the time frames here, we won't be able to go into all the detail of all the KPIs in terms of you know, what it is we've achieved. But I just wanted to point this out: is uh, you know how we use this open planning, and, and because it's a wiki. We are able to extract the KPIs that are related to the different working groups on the individual pages of those working groups. And so that's how each of the working groups get to see what their KPIs are. And so the color coding here is the green uh, rows are those which relate to our first year of study, our minimum viable product. Uh, the others are more general uh, sort of KPIs. Um, and the white ones are the ones that, as part of our evergreen strategic planning process, we you know, agreed that you know, we're not going to be able to get to those this year, they're, they're not high priorities. So that's kind of how it works. Uh, I thought the best way of summarizing uh, what we have done this year would be to have a look at let me, let me put it back there. Uh, the progress report which we've handed out. You should have a copy of the progress report. So if you're looking for a, I think it's on the center of the desk that I put them there. That's kind of a, a progress report of where we're at. And you can see the various components there. In particular, the key issues that we need to have a look at are, of course, our progress on the MVP action plan. So I'm going to work from the wiki um, to review that action plan. Give a high level summary of what we've done. So, basically, where we are at is in terms of our KPIs for this year, we were aiming to achieve uh, 13 full, you know, full courses available for delivery by the end of the year. We are currently tracking to have 20 courses available by the end of the, uh, of the current year. Um, so we're slightly over achieving on our KPI. Bearing in mind, we've still got another quarter of the year to go, so the, you know, the other developers that are progressing. But what we, are, what we are aiming for with regards to MVP are two exit awards, the Certificate of General Studies uh, through uh, Thompson Rivers University, and of course, the CERN HE, which is being developed here at uh, UHI. And the confirmed courses we have listed, in, and I have reported on the various state of completion of those courses in the uh, print version of the report. But, you know, creating sustainable futures, principles of management, principles of marketing, corporate communication, regional relations in Asia and the Pacific, Indigenous Australia, art appreciation and techniques, introduction to critical reasoning. Uh, introduction to Site 1, 
uh, introduction to research methods in psychology, introduction to business, introduction to customer centered business, <coughs> introduction to operations management, learning in the digital age, uh, elite sport performance. We're not sure what uh, what's, uh, the face of that yet. World history in the modern era, introduction to project management, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and the <coughs> composition. So that's the full list of, of courses we are targeting for, for MVP. And we have will have sufficient product to articulate uh, into those two exit awards. So that's actually a very healthy position for, for the OERU in that we would be able to offer a full year of study for the learners. So that is where most of our development has taken place this year. Of course, there have been a, a number of other activities. We, uh, the capacity development work that we've done, we ran the um, digital skills for collaborative OER development course as part of our professional development early in the year. We ran uh, four prototype courses this year, introducing and testing uh, and two new technological components, which uh, Dave, uh, I suspect, will refer to. <laughs> One was the integration of the new discussion forum technology into the course fee. The other was actually using marketing automation software to assist with sending out email instructions uh, to the learners who opted to register for the course. Um, so there's a bit of new technology that we were testing and prototyping. It, it's working very well. Um, in terms of the MVP technology platform, we uh, Finalize the, the pedagogical specifications. That, that's really just the functionality that's required for this minimum viable product technology platform. Uh, we've introduced uh, Mautic, which is an open source bit of technology around marketing automation, which is going to have huge potential for the area of you. Um, we commenced work on a minimum viable product uh, analytics project. We were very fortunate to receive uh, some capacity from the William and Flora. Hewlett Foundation, uh, they uh, have a company called Lunametrics, which does a, a lot of work for them around analytics. And they've allocated a, a reasonable amount of time of, from Lunametrics to assist with helping our you know, learning and, uh, analytics at OERU. So that's an ongoing project in terms of what's happening. A considerably uh, Significant project this year was our uh, marketing communications and fund development project. Uh, we received a capacity development grant from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. Every year they, uh, oh, I'm not sure if it's every year, but they frequently uh, identify, uh, put an offer out to grantees. Uh, we are a grantee of the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation if we need any capacity development. And, and with this opportunity, I said, well, there's one area we're particularly weak at, and then Dave and Bull would be able to vouch with me as marketing, because this is not our area. And, and so we were fortunate enough to get a grant, and we were able to appoint a professional marketing consultant to help us take uh, marketing forward. And in that regard, uh, we've developed uh, a whole range of marketing uh, Collateral, so to speak, uh, and there are really two areas of the marketing focus. One is to help support us with partner recruitment and partner engagement in the area of you. The other, of course, is to start thinking about well, how do we recruit or, or, or get the word out about OVRU to the learners we are aiming to serve? Right. So it's the student recruitment side as well as the partner recruitment side. And so the, uh, a number of mark. Uh, Marketing and communications uh, collateral. Uh, a number of case studies which explain how this model works. Um, we have the, the business model canvas, and I printed an example for you. Uh, the actual business model itself is a two pager, which is intended to help in, you know, institutions understand you know, actually how this model works from a business perspective. And being openly licensed, the, how this is supposed to work is that in, individual institutions would be able to tweak. And you know, change that plan to suit their own requirements and their own <coughs> business plans around this. Uh, we have a, a professionally prepared brochure which you know, called Seven Things You Should Know About OERU, which aims to be a succinct uh, summary. In addition to this, uh, if you go to the OERU uh, website, we have now introduced OERU. We've now introduced what is called lead capture on every single page. 
So I mean, if, for example, uh, you scroll down to the footer area, people who come to the site and visit the site can, if they want to, subscribe to receive information. And sitting on the back end, we have this mounting engine, and depending on what you register or what you're opting for, we can automate various campaigns. Uh, one of the campaigns is a drip feed campaign, which over a period of four weeks provides prospective partners uh, you know, a good, well-prepared information on what the OERU is about, um, with, with the intention of assisting with partner recruitment. Similarly, when on, on the learner side, and we'll show examples of this later, we can actually set up so-called campaigns, which actually automate the process of communications with the learners. So a learner could say, hey, I'm interested in that course, they will click, they will immediately receive an email saying, oh, you know, this is what this course is about, welcome, uh, we're starting on that particular date, and then on that date they'll get the instructions. So that's all automated on the back end. Uh, because you must remember, we, the OERU model is a model where we do not provide tutorial and support. And the OER Foundation is, yeah, again, is the OER Foundation, we are two staff. Um, so you can imagine, you know, running 20 courses to a large number of learners, we have to have good you know, processes on the back end uh, to help support that. And so this has been the most significant uh, you know, find, if you will, of aggressive development on our side is how to use marketing automation technology to support learning. So uh, that's on the marketing automation side. The other thing which I thought I should just quickly show you is uh, at least give you a sense of what how a learner will navigate to a course so you can get that perspective uh, in terms of how this might work. So a learner would go to the main OERU.org site, right? Um, and they'll, you know, they'll look on courses, uh, you'll see well, what are the future courses that are going to be running. Oh, here's a course that's going to be running, you know, the Inspiring Challenge of Sustainable Development, it's one of the micro courses. If, uh, if the learner wants to get more information about that course, they, you know, they get the summary. This is what this course is about. This is what you're going to learn. Here are the people you know, that developed and assembled the course. Uh, it will you know, give information on how it articulates to the various exit awards. And if the learner wants to uh, start learning, they, they click right through and they enter the course materials. And remember I said that it's this whole thing that learners must be able to navigate the course materials without having to register a password. And so at this point, you know, a learner can actually, and this is what an OERU course looks like, right? Um, it's basically assembled from a number of learning pathways, which are learning sequences which guide you in your discovery and learning around open access materials and OERs, right? And so this learning pathway is an example of a learning pathway. Uh, the first one here, sustainability is entirely possible. Learners will click on this and they can see, oh, okay, here's a video signpost. Um, these are the academics that will develop the course, they, you know, introducing themselves, telling the folk what this is about. There's a bunch of stuff that happens here, you know, going to look at this, do that. And on many pages, we have this ability for learners to interact through microblogging, this kind of stream of digital consciousness. So they can either, well, they can you know, just type in comments here, they receive prompts in the materials. And that's part of the peer learning support. So our pedagogy incorporates a high level of peer learning support. So the learners are supporting each other um, by interacting. Just uh, a quick question. So yes, of course. That functionality, we know it there is different to the one that we're using. We have to sign up to, do, to use that. So, so obviously, if you, if you are going to participate in interactions, you will have to register because that's your staff management. Right. Well, so, uh, so it's, and, and that's optional. Right? Learners will be able to see the feed. They won't. They won't, no, but in order to post, yeah. okay. you would have to register, and that's yeah. the only way we can manage them. Yeah. Okay. Um, there are also forum technologies and the like, and, and, and what Dave will do is he will actually take you underneath the hood a little and explain how that all works. Uh, but I just wanted to show you, of course, from you know, sort of a learner perspective. Um, here you will see, for example, you know, the course feed. Uh, and what this is doing is it's actually harvesting contributions from different sources. So if a learner posts a comment on the course site, it will be harvested. If a, uh, if a learner uh, sets up a course blog to keep track of the learning artifacts, uh, we will harvest that, that course blog into the feed. 
Our discussion forum engine that we use, uh, if any learners post, it gets harvested into the feed. So we, we've got distributed interactions, right, that are centralized to this bit of technology here. And that's basically how this works. Uh, and you know, I say this time in cheap, but uh, <coughs> none of this technology resides in the learning management system. Uh, and this is not, we are not on a mission to rid the world of the shackles of learning management systems. It's just that if we are thinking about open boundary forces, we have to think about ways of how we integrate these technologies across the delivery platforms that our partners are using. And, and, and so this is why we've assembled uh, these course materials in this particular way. And the technology with Dave will talk about this uh, in, in a bit. Um, will enable you to integrate with your own publishing platforms with relative ease. Um, so we're in an interesting space as far as that's concerned. So that's uh, basically what I wanted to just uh, cover, except the last uh, item here is, for those of you who attended the very first meeting will recall a presentation that was given by Jim Taylor around the pedagogy of discovery. Um, this notion of free-range learning. And it's one of the very interesting uh, opportunities we have with our delivery model in that we can you know, uh, guide learners to find open education resources and open access materials in pursuit of their own learning objectives. So in other words, the pedagogy becomes a pedagogy where you have the opportunity of guiding learners to find things in relation to their learning in pursuit of their own learning interests. And the particular course that Jim applied this technology with was the uh, regional relations in Asia and the Pacific. And it's actually a very good example because the Asia Pacific region, I forget the exact numbers, but it's, it's around about 45 to 50 different countries that form part of the Asia Pacific region, you know, every country that touches the Pacific Ocean. It would be extremely hard to prescribe a closed textbook covering 50 countries to enable learners to pursue their own country interests. And so here was an example of a pedagogy of discovery where learners were invited to go and find open access resources in relation to the countries that they were interested in that were mapped to the assessment criteria and various activities of the course, and hence this free-range learning pedagogy of discovery. And one of the things we've integrated now is uh, another piece of open source technology which gives us the capabilities of actually implementing this pedagogy of discovery for those designers who want to implement it. It's about this thing about not dictating pedagogy. If you want to use it, it's there, uh, but you don't have to. And if you are familiar with social bookmarking, technologies like De Deja, uh, where you know, if you find a link, you can annotate that link and you can share that link, uh, with the community, that's the kind of technology we're speaking about here. And this is an open source technology. So here's a, a course, Learning in a Digital Age, and I hope we can speak about this course in more detail. This is a course that is focusing on building learning and digital literacies for tertiary study. It's a first year course that will be accredited, and I'm hoping that there are more institutions in the network who will consider teaching a course like this for formal academic credit at your own institutions. Um, so here's an activity, the learners early in the sequence are asked to go and you know, develop their own definition of what digital literacy is. It's an activity, go and find a bunch of definitions on digital literacy and share them. It's as simple as that. So they go and search it, find this, evaluate it, annotate it, and then what they do is they invite it to post uh, on this site here, uh, OERU Bookmark. So you get this is a, an open source equivalent of Deja. So you get the idea here. So all the resources that learners have uh, selected in relation to the tag digital skills. Uh, for example, I picked digital skills, only two resources now because I just populated them as an example. But you get the idea. And what learners are able to do is if they see another bookmark that's of particular interest to their own learning, they can copy that bookmark to their own sort of bookmark space. They can share it publicly. If they find resources they like, they can vote for them. The real power of this technology is because it's a tagging system, it has uh, the ability for us to harvest feeds into the course feed related to particular topics, right? So that's, uh, I, I just wanted to point that out because Jim was very keen to 
to progress the pedagogy of discovery, and we do now have the technologies in place to be able to support that sort of thing. Any questions? Just one on that last point. I mean, it's a really exciting concept of allowing people to pursue, to some extent, their own learning outcomes. Yeah. But it just prompted me to think about you know, what the student expectations of a university or, or higher education is. Are we looking at that? Because you know, there's a very traditional bricks and mortar definition of the university, we know what that is. But do students, do we know if students are looking at these new type of approaches as a legitimate way of getting higher education? Or are they expecting something which is more traditional? Give an example, you know the way when you're trying to teach someone, you can actually create a fantastic learning experience where you do very little teaching. But the, you know that the learning is taking place, and sometimes students feel very short changed because you're not teaching. So it's just whether we've collectively thought about the student expectations <coughs> when we start putting forward exciting but different approaches. Oh, absolutely. And part of what this course is about is A, it's not just the skills to develop with this learning in a digital age course, it's also about managing those expectations. Uh, because the OERU model is a model where we don't provide tutorial support and we are very upfront about that. We don't pretend to be something that we are not. And so learners will know um, your support are your peers. And, and, but we're hoping that um, through you know, smart design, that you know, the quality of the learning experience is up to it in terms of what the academic standards are required. But there's another component we're hoping to be able to introduce uh, in the future this concept that was. In fact, the first meeting was already discussed was this notion of academic volunteers international and, and how we might be able to progress something like that. But it's also one of these chicken and egg type of things. We have to have the critical mass of courses, the critical mass of learners in order to build you know, something like ABI. So we could start thinking about things like, for example, community, community service learning. In theory, we could have a course at whatever level that might be a community service learning course. We, what the learners are in fact going to be doing is supporting the OERU uh, through, through in various ways, and they might actually get credit for that. So, but we're not there yet. What about student feedback? So I'm just thinking, because you, you showed the history of the development of OERU, <laughs> and I'm just thinking that we won't get it right the first time, and there'll be issues with what we put out in the various ways we use the materials and support the yeah. students. Um, we look at having some sort of standard minimum student feedback from the experience. We could start to use and build as a uh, an body of evidence we can use to what works, what isn't, what needs to change. So that's part of our learning analytics work. Um, you know, we are trying to track uh, track a lot of that data. Some of it is also in design, uh, in terms of how you uh, how you can feedback. In other words, you pre-prepare feedback on activities based on you know, our knowledge and experience of doing these sort of things in a distance learning environment. So you know, sort of a trivial example is, you know, if you've got a, a quiz item, for example, having feedback on correct and incorrect answers. So learners will be getting that kind of automated feedback. But it is informed by experience, um, you know, experienced academics are developing these courses here. Yeah. But improving a course based on uh, student feedback. This From is, the students to us. Yeah, this is a revolutionary idea. Our traditional university <laughs> <can> get onto <laughs> it. Um, but what, what I would suggest is it's not necessary. It's a good thing, but we could just have, to, if, they're, if traditional universities are getting away with it without student feedback, so can we. That would be my point. But if people want to do that with the student feedback, I think that's wonderful. The question I ask is, okay, I'm a student, I've done all that, I've met, I believe I've mastered all this uh, material, I want to take the uh, assessment. Okay. Could you lead us through that? So um, we will have a session on looking at the assessment. In short, the, the, the three dominant forms of assessment that are being used is a, a course assignment type of approach, you know, there's no proper rubrics, so there's a paper. Well, I'm just looking at the technique. The technology of what happens. How? Oh, what, what happens is that the learner comes to Athabasca University and says, I want you to assess me if yours is a designated course. But how does it work on there? I want to see how it works on our system. Yeah, I'll touch on that a little bit. I mean, some of those things are still, still yeah. need to be. But, but what we would do is we would automate. So, so say it's your course, right? Um, say it's my Greek economics. Yeah. 
we will automate the instructions which say, that, well, if you want to get the credit from Athabasca University, go and take this CAP exam at that point, and they will get those instructions. So we will then route those to the Okay, computer. so that hasn't been built into the system yet. The thing with Rory, our, our challenge is we can't do that because we do, that can't do the identity validation. It's a contract between the learner and the individual party. <coughs> no, but there's steps going. Is okay. Here I'm a student. I've gone through this course. I think I've mastered the material. Oh, it's built into the What's course. What's on there? It's is, built into the course. Is it yeah. should say maybe you know if you've mastered it, you could get credit for this from these universities. And here, click here. You go to Athabasca, or you go to the CLEP, yeah. or you go to yeah. South, uh, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but we don't have that yet, is what you're saying. No, that, that, that's, I think that the solution, though, is that there would be that sort of link so that when you get to a point uh, where you do want to undertake the assessment, there is a link to the particular institution Absolutely. that you're going to, to undertake the assessment with. And that that link would actually lead to some sort of payment or registration gateway. Yeah. So, so really there are two ways that will be done. One would embedded in the course would be the information the learner needs in order to get to that assessment point, right? Based on what the institutions tell us. And the second one will on the OERU website, there will be a high level overview. So well, there are two qualifications you can get. Here are the courses, these are the people that are providing assessment services, that's where you can get your credit. Credit can be transferred in mm -hmm. these ways. So with an information model with the links to where that happens, yeah. Rob? Just a point of clarification on the previous question. You said there's learning analytics sort of strand to this thing with student feedback. Is anyone actually speaking with students and talking to them from their point of view, what's going on, do they like it, etc.? Um, the way we've been doing it up until now, have been to do surveys, just you know, standard surveys to learners. Uh, and that that's the extent of feedback. I think what? Is it annual survey? Or? Well, uh, we, we do, we're running our first year next, oh, next yeah. year. So there will be a, a course evaluation survey, or well, this is the intent, a course evaluation survey on every course, optional of course, yeah. And that's, part of, and that's part of the work of the process evaluation discussion that we will be having later uh, tomorrow, I believe. Yeah. So we'll be actually scoping that in more detail. Just, just a kind of follow up about the, the survey. I mean, when when you survey through this annual survey, is it is it more about kind of student satisfaction, or is it about student behaviour? Uh, it's it's a bit of both, yeah. um, and we will we'll be able to look at the surveys that we've got, right. and I'm sure there's lots of room for improvement. Yeah. I mean, the reason I say that is that I think one of the really interesting questions is a lot you can get out of the, uh, the kind of online analytics, but there's also what goes beyond that? You know, what, the, what happens when students go offline, for example? And exactly. we've, we've got some really interesting data on uh, unexpected things that students do, which you could not possibly understand absolutely on our analytics. And, and, that's, and that's important, I think. And I guess I disagree with Rory a bit here, because actually some of those things you might learn from that actually you need to feed back into the way you design in future. And it's, it is a very good point. You can try. You can triangulate your. You can triangulate your information by comparing voluntarily provided survey results from the actual hard information that you get, and you can see oftentimes there'll be there'll be um, inconsistencies or, or unexpected um, artifacts in that because people will have an intention that they don't make good on in the actual <coughs> real world, and so on. And, and also that you know, they may have. You know, being able to map intention against actual behavior. Could I just clarify my position on that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. This is wonderful student feedback. I think we should work on that and do it. All I'm saying is that we can do like traditional universities as well, those who want to. And there's no student feedback. They just take the test, you give them the mark, and that's it. And that's fine. But for those who want more, I think it's a great thing. Let's, yeah. you know, you do more. But those that don't want to do more, that's fine too. Okay, okay. I'm, just, I'm just conscious of the time because we need, need to move on. And this is serving its purpose because it is kind of introducing and doing the discussion, which we will take into sort of the breakout sessions. 
if that's okay. If I can just make one comment, that this is just with regard to our uh, uh, virtual visitors. We have a question on Twitter from Gabby Whithouse. Uh, I just don't want her oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to be missed here. So she has a question. Um, uh, how do the WD notes uh, interactions compare with discussion forums? Sorry, say again. <laughs> I'm trying to organize the transition between the Sorry, I think she's I'm sorry to do that. That's okay. Let me know when you're ready. I'll Okay. I'm ready. Okay. She's just asking how WE notes compares with the sort of a three other types of discussion forum that are available for learners. Okay, it's a good question. So, Wiki Educator Notes is really a microblogging technology. Uh, it's limited characters. Um, we have an alternative uh, discussion forum technology which we use. This course Dave will be speaking about that. And perhaps uh, Gabe's question will be answered in more detail with Dave's uh, presentation. The big difference is ours is all open source. And the second issue is harvesting Twitter feeds is not in accordance with the terms of service, so we can't use Twitter as an interaction uh, medium. Uh, in OERU, because it doesn't meet the terms of service requirements. The WV notes, uh, is it one sort of aggregation for the entire course, or can it be split up uh, per learning activity, for example? At the, at the moment, it's per course. Uh, there is the potential with additional uh, development, and the kind of development part of the potential we get engaged with, we would be able to do it at the activity level as well. Correct. But that technology isn't available yet. Yeah, we're having so I must be very interesting if we have to we do it looks like the, the room is freaking out. <laughs> the room system is freaking out and both these kind of things. All right, so they could just be like this and that's a just easy to go Yeah, our uh, lecture theater is telling us oh, here we go. Actually, a, a web-based presentation, so you can um, look at it at any stage before, or after, uh, or now, or, or subsequently. Um, so, as I introduced myself earlier, I'm on the open education. Uh, sorry, the open source technologist with the Open Education Research Resource Foundation, um, and I'm in the Christchurch, New Zealand office. Um, I want to say right up front that uh, there's some pretty cool technology that has been developed by the foundation for the OERU, um, and I don't want to claim credit for quite a lot of it. In fact, things like the V-notes and the, the snapshotting capabilities I'm going to describe are actually something I need to credit uh, my predecessor, um, 
Jim Titzler quit, and then he has uh, he has resigned during the course of the past year. So I've inherited many of his uh, of his um, technological uh, wonders, and I now have to get my head around all of them. But I've also introduced some further just just because I like to make life hard for myself. I've introduced some further technology. Um, so we've got plenty of things to uh, contend with. I'm going to try to advance both of these at the same time. So, um, as you know, we're talking today about the minimum viable product uh, for the OERU. What I'm going to describe is the tool set which underlies this product, uh, minimum product, and it's based on a collaborative offering platform, which you're probably familiar with, with Gitcator, and with a uh, delivery platform, which is uh, the default delivery platform, which is WordPress, um, and we provide course.oeru.org as a option for your WordPress platform. Our tool set also includes collaborative communication tools uh, to engage both educators and learners, and we are incorporating analytical tools, which has already been mentioned, um, to help us measure the effectiveness of the various practices we adopt and allow us to improve based on actual use. So um, the big question, as you've all been asking, is how will this actually work in practice? And so the idea behind this talk is to give you a taste of that. Um, OERU partner representatives assemble course materials in Wiki Educator uh, in collaboration with other educators. They can incorporate rich content that is multimedia and tabular information and um, quizzes and various other forms of, of material. Um, all work is protected by version control, and um, that may or may not be something all of you are familiar with, but I'll hopefully be able to give you a sense of that. Um, and this material can be edited from anywhere. People can interact with this material and, and work on it from anywhere, as long as they have internet connection. So it's a relatively low bar for, for involvement. Educators can plan and contribute to individual courses. Oh, sorry, hang on. Actually, go down here and show you some more details. So, this is an example of a Wiki Educator page being edited with a rich text environment, a rich text editing environment. So, it's very similar to a word processor. So, just to show you that it's not necessarily an intimidating thing uh, from a technological point of view, it's a relatively simple interface to work with, and it allows you um, to develop these kinds of materials uh, in a way that's relatively similar to what you've been used to with working with a word processor. There are other ways to do things as well, um, which you may find are more efficient when you become more familiar with the technology, but that's the bridge you can cross uh, when, when you get to that stage. Um, I mentioned version control before. Um, version control involves, it's similar to, to people will be familiar with track changes in a, in a word processing document. This is kind of like that on steroids. And it allows different people to contribute. Every time a page is saved on the wiki, a new revision is created. And it allows you to go back at any time and see who has done what, for the reason when. You can look at the differences between any two uh, versions of, of any particular page in the wiki. So it's an extremely rich and granular source of, of protection for your data. So if you save something, you know that you'll always be able to get back to it, even if someone else comes in and deletes your page for, by, for, by accident, for example. You can recover all these things because the version control protects that. Um, I'll show you an example. This is this is what uh, a, a comparison between two revisions might look like. It's similar to track changes. You can see what the what one version looked like, and then the, the subsequent change is highlighted for you, and you can you can determine. There will also be a um, a log entry that the person making the change can make that explains why they've made a change, which is often very very helpful. This is an example of editing a quiz in the wiki. And so it just shows on the right hand side, this is not done with the rich text editor because it requires a bit more um, ability to add semantic information to the, to the content that you're putting in. So it allows you to, to um, set your, um, your quiz questions and answers to the correct answers and the incorrect answers and, and the responses that the learner gets when they uh, select any particular answer. Right. So the next step that we get is um, educators can plan and contribute to individual courses, and new collaborators can also be brought up to speed, uh, coordinating tasks through.
through our Kanban planning board is one option. Uh, through email mailing lists is another medium through which they can communicate. Uh, and by uh, perusing their archives, so the email lists are all archived in such a way that someone coming into a team of existing collaborators can quickly get up to speed by looking at past conversation and use that as a, as a resource that's always available. Um, we also have a searchable community forum, so it depends on the modes in which people want to or are most comfortable interacting. Educators can also collaborate in real time with other, educator, other educators uh, and us at the OER Foundation through our instant messaging chat environment. So I'll show you a little bit about those. So this is the Kanban system that allows us to set up tasks and manage the allocation of tasks and the status, the stages of completion. This is a Kanban board in case any of you haven't seen one before. And this will set, do things like send emails to people who have um, identified specific tasks that are of interest to them and if they change their state or if someone adds a comment to them or if you can drill down into each one of these tasks and you can add information, you can, you can allocate yourself or someone else to, uh, to actually be responsible for those items, you can assign priorities, you can do all kinds of, of useful things in a very straightforward sort of canvas there. Um, and it allows you to, um, it allows you to uh, be pulled back into the process if you, if you happen to um, have this aspects of this that you're particularly concerned about. Uh, this is an example just of, of one of the mailing lists. Uh, it just shows recent topics of conversation, the people who are involved, and the ability to search through the archives. This is engaged with primarily through email, so that you would only go to the website if you wanted to um, get an overview uh, or do searching of, of the archives. Um, this is an example page of our uh, OER community forum, which is a a uh, place for educators primarily to collaborate, and this just gives you a sense of the topics and the, and the way the topics are meant. You can drill down into each one of these and um, get further information and submit your responses or questions, and uh, you can have threaded discussions within this. Um, and then there's our chat interface, which is real-time chat, but the nice thing is that all the chat information, if some of you have ever used Slack, this is an open source alternative to Slack, which actually has a number of uh, technical advantages as well, but it, it's it means that all of your conversations are actually captured and can be searched historically. So in the event that someone says something of importance, um, you can actually provide a link to it to someone, and um, and they can actually track back to that information, and uh, it's not lost. It's not a, an ephemeral source of discussion. It actually is is retained. Um, okay. So the courses that are offered by the OER, any partner can harvest any course on Wiki Educator at any time and create a snapshotable version for their institution. And what that looks like is uh, each course is assembled according to a course outline, which is a convention uh, in which a conventional way in which to set up and to draw together the materials that are already published on Wiki Educator. So you publish the materials and then you can you can assemble them and pull them together based on how you create this, this um, course outline. You'll notice at the top is a request snapshot button. Pushing that button is literally all you have to do to have the entire course that you see, head, the head, headings for which you see here, transferred onto a live wiki, sorry, onto a live WordPress educational site on a per course offering basis. And you can, so we know of other organizations where doing something like that is a three or four day process for or five full-time designers. <coughs> yes? Uh, when you export that, does it export it in a modular way so that you could kind of pull a chunk out and put something else in there, or is it more like a text dump? At the moment, it's a text dump, but the idea is that you can come back in here and you can alter any of the content and just run another snapshot if you need to alter it, and it takes a couple minutes at most. Um, so we are going to be looking into increasing the modularity of it so that you can do pull out little bits and pieces at, at a time. But for the moment, that's the, uh, the current practice. Um, and it produces a reasonably tidy looking uh, website. And this is an example of a wiki page on the left and a resulting WordPress site page on the right. You've probably seen this already, and I think Wayne um, used this as an example of this particular page. But you can see that the, the navigation is, is exposed on the right hand side in a more web focused, web-friendly sort of way rather than in the, in the wiki 
approach. And the idea is that this is also a completely mobile friendly, um, a completely mobile friendly thing as well. So the, the, the output is, 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 is designed to be mobile um, first so that, that you can use it in, in, with, that, with whichever mode of um, online device you have available. Uh, okay, so learners can sign up for courses either through partner institutions or by signing up directly through the OIU.org. Uh, this is particularly well suited to supporting open boundary courses, as we mentioned previously. By registering, learners will be engaged with the course material instructional emails. These communications will be delivered through our learner engagement platform, Mautic, which Lorraine just mentioned, which will allow us to determine when learners act upon these emails. Um, so I'll just show you an example of this is this is a, an example email that a learner would get if they sign up for uh, this CSF course. Um, and the idea is the idea here is that um, we can reduce we can allow our uh, number of, of participants to increase without a substantial increase in administrative overheads. And the scalability of this approach is, I think, one of its killer features. I don't know. We really highlighted that. <coughs> so the idea is that uh, someone running a course can prepare all the communications for the students ahead of time, and they can reuse them from one offering of the course to the next. And they simply have to initiate a set of rules in Mautic to, to ensure that all the course emails are delivered in a timely manner based on that particular running of the course. Does that make sense? Okay. So. Learners can also gain perspective in all of this by sharing, uh, because they can use things like WeNotes, which has been shown before, to um, communicate with their with their fellow learners, uh, and also with potentially any academic staff or, or uh, educators that are involved in the process. Um, and they can also have their 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 interactions pulled from various external sources. I'll show you an example here. This, uh, on the background here, you can see a very small version of a very long wiki, uh, sorry, we, we notes, which by the way, we stands for uh, wiki educator. So wiki educator notes. There's a, a stream of them down here. So that's from a, a course that was recently run. And I'm just showing examples here of a, uh, someone who's put a, a note directly into this box. Those, those are listed, you may not be able to see it from there, but those are listed as being from, <coughs> from the course, so they come directly through the site. So a learner might just enter we know right there on the feed page. Um, but they could also just do a tweet, or they could have a blog post which has been tagged with the course number, or they could have uh, a, um, their, we, we support other technologies as well, um, for example, Google Plus, or um, on our, on our uh, chat service that, that we showed you earlier. And the forums, if they make a post in any of those places and it's appropriately tagged with the course, it will appear in this feed. So this just shows you how someone's, this is someone's blog post from their own blog site that has been pulled in as a reference and they just click on, they just click on, anyone can click on that to get to that page. And similarly, here's a, um, a post from the forum. And that was the original post that it points to. And so on. So it just shows you how you can draw together and aggregate all of this communication and support a lot of. Uh, what you're doing is automating a process that instead of us having to use this and that to have a whole lot of recipes to feed into something, you've got that already sitting there. Yes. Yeah. Which is fantastic. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. And I can't take credit for that. This is this is Jim Titzler's um, cleverness by and large. That's exactly what you need to have driving courses online. Yeah. Well, we're aiming to uh, build a better mousepad. Okay, so. Um, yes. You said if they make a blog post, yep. it will go to the aggregated area. That's right. In any, I mean, in which. Um, in which technologies? Yeah. Um, at this stage, there is a standard for blogs be syndicated using something called uh, really simple syndication or RSS and essentially any blog that supplies that can be uh, harvested in this way so what happens is when a, when a student signs up for a course they include the URL of their blog and uh, our system kind of looks for the normally well-known places that an RSS feed would be uh, found and it incorporated periodically just scans that and says is there a post 
with this tag in. Is there a post with this tag in? And it will just check every every hour or so. And uh, and then if if one is found, then it will be incorporated. Thank you. That was the exact level of detail I needed. Perfect. Um, so having achieved that, uh, learners, as you have uh, already asked, learners um, who have believed they have met the requirements for the course um, and, and have mastered the material can then request an assessment by whatever means is deemed necessary or appropriate by the hosting partner institution and can earn credit upon meeting the assessment requirements. Um, now, as you as you partly asked, how is this integrated into the process? Um, at this stage, uh, because we're not yet offering the credentials, it hasn't really been uh, formalized, but the idea is that all of these tools simply can provide links and references to the accrediting organizations. Uh, and and it's, we also can provide um, marketing collateral materials that can be used to further, um, uh, you know, if, for example, there might be competition between different institutions who can offer assessment services. This is a way that they can differentiate themselves through advertising uh, add to the to the people and the learners who are involved in the course. Um, so we have video advertising, which can be, by the way, branded by any of our partner institutions. Um, so this video on the, on the left, you can see with the sample of the, the Tiger Polytech um, branding. Uh, similarly, this um, this course sign up uh, uh, brochure. And then there's also a rack card here, which is just, just to give you some examples of the kind of marketing collateral that are available. And those act as templates for, for what that can be used by each partner institution to promote their own services. And I want to just um, say this, this from, from my point of view as, a, as an open source, passionate open source software person, um, the thing that really finds, that really resonates with me about this, this entire OERU approach is the idea of permissionless learning. Uh, we, in, in the software world, we refer, to, we refer to permissionless innovation because you never know where the good ideas will come from. All you can do is you can try to create the conditions in which innovation can occur, and I think learning is very similar. Um, could, you, could you repeat what you just said? Uh, <laughs> so permissionless innovation is something that's very um, commonly uh, promoted through the, open, the world of open source software because by making code available, and the analogy here is by making learning materials available, you never know what will come from people actually having access to that, which they combine then with their aptitude and their motivation uh, to, to convert into learning, or in the case of software, to convert into some piece of software that's useful. So instead of producing the next um, amazing piece of software, they, we might produce the next genius who produces the next amazing piece of software, or we would choose world peace or something like that. Um, the goal is modest. Yeah, the goal is modest, that's right. We aim, we aim low and uh, that way we're sure it pleases. Um, yes? It's just, just back to the previous one, I'm wondering if we want to rethink even the word fail. Uh, you know, <laughs> yes, it's a it's question. maybe the ability to experiment, to try. To, yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just don't want to attach the idea of failure to going in and just seeing what you can do or how you play around with it. I know it's probably not your choice of word, but I'm just thinking. Well, I agree. I, I also had uh, some trepidation about using that term. Um, or although, the quotation marks to, uh, yeah, I suppose. to imply the idea that some see that they try something and it moves in a different direction from what you expected, yeah. that's a failure, right? Rather than just simply giving yourself a chance to try something new. Yep. That's why I, I tried to soften it by including the or not there, but um, <laughs> I suspect that, that wasn't quite right. I should turn it around and say you can succeed um, without having planned to. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, despite your expectations, yes. Um, so essentially what we're trying to say here is that all the learner needs, with, with the OERU for the first time in history, all the learner needs anywhere in the world to improve their prospects is aptitude, motivation, and opportunity. In this case, opportunity is provided simply by having an internet-connected device. Nothing more, nothing less. Um, so. Uh, as we've said before, our tool set is entirely open source software. So I think um, for us at the OER Foundation, uh, it's it's a cultural alignment and consistency with our open principles. And we don't just talk about being open, we bloody well are open. By hook or by crook. Um, for our partners, the advantage of this is an opportunity to experience and use tools that they don't that don't get aggressively marketed to you. 
The OERU tools that work well for you are there for the taking. You can cherry pick the ones that you like best, and with our assistance, you can adopt them for your own institutions. And also, with open source tools, you benefit from economies of scale because with because these tools have all the international or, sorry, all these tools have international user bases, but you don't get treated like a small fish in a big pond when you use them. You, as the user, you are also the, the developer. You have that right built into into the fact that it's open source. So, plus, each open source tool that your institution adopts will likely save you far more than your OERU annual membership. <coughs> just throwing it out there. So, it could make it all worthwhile with just one tool adoption. Um, for learners, this, this approach means accessibility and empowerment because with our tool set, they won't be denied access to tools for lack of money for proprietary license, licenses, nor are they forced to sacrifice their freedoms in technology choice. Not only can learners use these tools to broaden their horizons, but they're also encouraged to learn how they work and perhaps even make them better. So um, to aid that, we've also set up uh, just recently the technology blog as part of the OERU, which is a place for people like me to provide kind of experiences, case studies, descriptions of these tools and how we actually implement them, which can be passed on as, as links to your IT teams. And you can say, look, I've been using this in my work with the OERU, and it actually is a pretty good tool. You should really be looking at it instead of the equivalent proprietary tool, which is worth a million dollars a year for, for that vendor, um, when you could actually have OERU's assistance in setting it up, because we'll provide <coughs> most of these for how to do it. This is a, this, all that stuff that you've been talking about is another edge of OERU that I had never thought of, but mm -hmm. which is actually incredibly important and attractive. And and back to the Division of Student Learning and say, go, let's do it. This is fantastic. And the beauty of it is you can say it's not because somebody recommended it to you. No, it's because you've been using it. That's right. You've been soaking it. <laughs> okay, and so finally, I just wanted to say, I know my time is probably past here, but um, I just wanted to say um, we're increasingly building analytic tools like a tool called PWIC and Mastic, which we've already men mentioned, into all of our services so that, for example, course websites and associated email communications will be handled by systems that can measure the results of those communications. So we can actually see when a user clicks on a link in an email. That is reported to us. We don't know the name of the person or who. We, we know that, for example, a particular link got clicked on a lot of times and another link that we thought was going to get clicked on didn't. And then we can start to say, well, actually, why did, why did that happen? Why did one work and the other didn't? We can then use that knowledge to start improving systems. Um, it allows us to adapt uh, constantly to, to the way that our learners are actually using things rather than the way we think they should use things, which is the, the famous um, failing of most software development is that the developers think they know how the users are going to use things and they generally don't. Um, just to give you an idea of how the Mautic system works, this is an example of a decision tree, a rule set for, for managing communications with a Mautic system based on how a particular, any particular user interacts with the, the materials that have already been sent to them. So essentially it has a, it has a quite a smart engine behind it that, uh, and I should, I should re reiterate, this is all open source software. It has a system behind it which allows um, a particular user to be tracked through their interactions with the course materials. And it allows them then to receive other emails when they achieve certain things. So it's essentially a way of of managing uh, interaction with a course that, that previously would have taken a lot of time and, and attention from, from uh, an educator, but in this case it can be managed uh, automatically, so it scales very nicely. Um, here's an example, uh, here's an example, if I can find it, of the PWIC. Um, uh, this is an analytic system for web usage, so Mautic focuses on interacting with email uh, email communications. PWIC allows you to, to track the way that websites are used based on the links that are clicked and the pages that are viewed and by whom and, and how, uh, for how long and how frequent and so on. You can get a better sense of who your audience is and you can break it down to an incredible degree. Um, just as another aside or another detail, we, we have a, a link shortener which we're using. So at the end of this talk, you'll see this short link that you can use to access my talk but we can use it for any other link that we provide as the OERU, and we can actually see whenever anyone clicks on that. So for example, if we put one short code for, in one particular email, we put a different short code into the same place in a different email, 
and that one gets clicked on heaps, and this one doesn't get clicked on, then we know that we've done something much better in this email to present that link than we did in this one, or something along those lines. So anyway, there's lots of opportunities for, for um, analytical uh, intelligence. So I'd like, just like to acknowledge um, the fact that I'm actually here is, is, is thanks to the OER and Platinum Partners who have funded my position. Um, and I also want to thank um, people like Brian and a number of others here in the room who have taken part in the technology working group um, because uh, you have essentially guided a lot of the work that I've done and helped validate that we're moving in the right direction. So thank you very much for that. And if you do want to see this presentation in future online, and by the way, all of my speaking notes are included in the presentation, so you just have to hit the letter S, the instructions on the next page. Um, you can see all of the notes that I that I spoke from, and also there are further links within those notes to some of these technologies so that you can follow them. And which software did you use to create the presentation? It is this piece of software here. It's called Reveal.js. It's an open source uh, browser-based uh, presentation library, very lightweight, in my opinion, far, far better than the alternatives, uh, proprietary alternatives. Uh, developers, if you're, if you're someone comfortable with web um, technologies, then you can create your own presentations very rapidly. You can just get the code by following the link that's right there. If you're not a developer, it doesn't mean this is out of your reach. There is a very interesting site called slides.com, which allows you to use a web browser interface to create your own slides. And uh, so essentially Reveal.js sits behind that system and then there's an interface that allows people who aren't web developers to drag and drop their slide decks and, uh, and you can achieve the same sort of thing. Um, and the little uh, key that's there is um, just to give you an idea of some of the keys. So for example, if I hit escape on this presentation, you can see that I can I can look at my whole presentation and go back through, and it, it actually exists like a tabletop, so you can you can have you can drill down into more detail for certain points if, if uh, depending on the time available. Uh, probably over well we can see the time. That's all good. But any any questions? Yep. Yep. A couple of things that strike me from that. Um, one uh, is a slightly HTML5, you, you talked about people having an internet connected device. Um, have, and this is a naive question, have we got an agreement that we will develop materials which are compatible with a range of devices? I'm thinking of places where you might have mobile phone access but not internet access. All of our, all of our development is designed to be mobile friendly and um, it's designed also to make the best use of the resources that the user has available. So if they have a big monitor, then, then it's designed to fill that as, much, as well as possible with any constraints. Of we could create, a, we collectively agree that when we create materials, they'll be compliant with HTML5, for example. Um, yeah, open standards and open file formats, of which HTML5 is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have other developments that are, uh, Athabasca, for example, is experimenting with some interesting approaches to create offline versions. Which of course is HTML based yeah. as well. Um, there is room for improvement on accessibility with our, our work. Uh, and we're the first to admit that. Well, it's, it's fair to say though that if you create your materials using the Wiki Educator approach that we've just, uh, just, just um, shown here, then by default the materials will be HTML5. You don't have to do anything special or different. It's just that those constraints are applied along the way to ensure that the result is HTML5. I mean, definitely not meant to criticize. I'm just no, sure, sure. no, no. We're we're very very conscious of being compliant with those standards, and that those standards are are if we don't meet those standards, then we don't we we we, we, we fail. So that's our our one of our objectives. <coughs> the, other, the other point was um, just what we've seen there is fantastic in terms of um, the set of the tool set that's available. I'm just thinking about how steep the learning curve will be for an academic, never mind the developers. Just thinking again, at an early stage, I know you've got blogs, etc., talk people through this, but almost creating, uh, I don't know, a talk through video which says, okay, you're thinking about you know, creating something for this, here are the tools to consider, here's how they use, just basic mm -hmm. introduction for the staff who might be thinking, will I go for this or will I not? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's an excellent point because that's going to help us with the next session, I think, and I think it's a good point. So if you keep that in, 
in the report back session. I'm just conscious of the time. Just before moving on, which has already just moved to the head, the working group that uh, Dave mentioned, we've been working on it. We've had people in the past from partner institutions, but just by kind of flow of people, the group has gotten a little smaller. And so when I just wanted to make a pitch for, if you have people at your institution that are developers, I'm suspecting most of you have people on your teams that like to bash at this stuff. And who knows, some of them might be looking for a change from supporting Blackboard or whatever it is they're doing. Um, so please do contact Dave or myself. You think you might have someone on your team that would like to be part of this? Well, if nothing else, we can we can learn more about the constraints and the environments in which you're working because those will inform the constraints that we and then, that we address in the work that we're doing. If we can if we can gain insight into this. Actually, Mark research for us. Last question. Please alleviate my concerns. And it's this, it's that we're building a cathedral and that really the minimal required project was a wiki page and a link to the institutions to take the test. And we don't have that up yet. What we have is this huge edifice and we're not, we're not there yet. We're not out the door. I oh, know, but Rory, I this think, is I think quite scary. Rory, I think you're misunderstanding. You, you have the edifice you've got. You have a delivery website at the press of a button that can link to any assessment service that's offered. I, I think yeah, but we don't. We have, we're not out the door with it. There's, there's, another, there's another way to look at this. You don't. No one here has to learn any more of these technologies than the few, one or two that they need to fulfill their their role within this whole process. Those technologies are just there for you to see what is available if should you find a need for it. But we're not forcing any of these down, down anyone's throat because we have we have no we we have no sunk cost in any of these that we have to recover. We we have we we provide these technologies and if any of them don't stick, if no one uses them, then we can get rid of them and, and we can try something different. That's the beauty. We've got a wiki that produces a WordPress site. That's what it is. That's all it is. Rory, if, 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 if to use your analogy, if you're worried about a cathedral, if you actually look at the way this technology has been the components of these are together. It exemplifies the bizarre approach, like as purely as any technical entity I've seen in education. It really is a, a we, bunch of loosely coupled open tools. We, we could be out the door now with a simple wiki page with the course on and we, a link we tried, to our We've been developing a wiki educator mm -hmm. using that framework for years, and every one of our partners told us that it wasn't a framework that we could go out the door with. That's why we did all this development. Presumably, just, just linking to something is the easy bit, right? Yeah. Just just to adding the link is easy. So that's not an issue, I think, for what you're, you're doing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really my week. In theory, we can implement tomorrow, be out the door tomorrow, we can. The, bit, the piece that we can't be out the door with tomorrow is guaranteeing the credit transfer. That's a piece we can't guarantee. And our approach has been until we can guaranteed that if you're telling a learner you are going to get transferred a transcript credit from institution X that's going to count towards that qualification, we can't be out the door. Yeah. I just want to emphasize this, this this process, and I watched this from day one, has not been holding anything back. I, uh, there have been parallel processes over the evolution of this project in terms of getting the, the minimum number of courses needed to get us a full year. Uh, of studies available, so we can really start promoting that. And the other is, and, and that's, that's I think, a part, part of this particular meeting, is making sure that we've now got that, those links that you were asking about Rory earlier. And an important question about now, where, where do they go once they finish these courses? Which institutions are ready to accept that, to get credit to do the test, to do the portfolio assessment, to do the exam, administration, marketing, and so on. So. Uh, this hasn't held anything back, and I think, as, as Brian said, um, I think we all sort of came to arrive at the conclusion that the wiki is, is a great open source tool for development uh, and for content uh, building in there. In terms of delivery, students in general find it a, a very complex space to navigate because there's these multiple layers of navigation. They're they're not fully comfortable in, in working in wiki text and things like that. So. So it's, it's building a delivery environment that's not LMS dependent is the other big piece. We want to stay non-proprietary, stay away from 
how one asks this. I, I think those are the kinds of questions that, that we were struggling with. It, it definitely hasn't been. This has not been part of the critical path in terms of getting the key pieces out. Um, I don't see a problem with the credit transfer either. Is some of our institutions are quite capable of accepting credits. Some are. Yeah. This and, is and, the way it is. And, and part of this meeting is to see which of those institutions can accept the credit tomorrow. And then we will prioritize and appoint the learners to those institutions. But, but we need to know who those institutions are. <coughs> I'd just like to come back to Brian's point about advocating for the technology working group. It seems to me in the best interest of every institution here to have a tech person from that institution contributing to that working group on the basis of what Dave said, which is that they only have to adopt one piece of open source software for their institution and they potentially will sell themselves a lot of money. That's a good point. That's good. Okay, so I'm going to be a benevolent dictator and move on to the next session of cut time and all the rest of that. So, so the point of view of this is we, we've had a snapshot view of where we're at, right? Um, you know, what we've achieved with all our strengths and weaknesses, okay? And, and the next part of the session is to actually have a look at what have we have done well, uh, what are the things we can improve on, and we'll break out into four groups. And the other question is, what should we be prioritizing for this meeting? What are the top three priorities this meeting should address? And forgive my insolence, I'm going to just number, and that will be your group allocation. So Rajiv, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, and we've got two breakout rooms. Um, one. So you know where the breakout rooms are. So basically, the breakout rooms, if you go to the right here, your first door to the right. The first room on the right is a small group, and there's another room at the end. You go walk through to the end. That can accommodate two groups. You'll have one group here. So, because I'm in four, I'll do four because I've got a connection here, I can help with the recording. Uh, let's have two in the first room, right? Three and, uh, uh, two, two and three in the far room. So, four here. One in the first room. One in the first room. And two and three in the, the last room. I'll, I'll see if I can remember where the first room So, you, you're, going, you're going to one, yeah. And who else? Irvin, have you got a connection? Uh, so I'm going to go to the I don't think so. <laughs> and we got to go around. People, if we could be back, if we could be back by 10 2. 10 2. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Uh, Oh, sorry. Give me the 